Hello, this is Dr. Benjamin Norris from the Chemistry Department at Frostburg State University. Today we're going to talk about nuclear magnetic spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy, and how it works. The structure you see on the right is tetramethylsilane, a molecule that is commonly used as an internal standard in NMR spectroscopy. We'll learn about how that works in an upcoming video. NMR spectroscopy is a powerful spectroscopic technique that allows us to learn things about the atoms that make up molecules by bombarding their nuclei with radio waves. The way that these nuclei interact with radio waves tell us something about the chemical environment of these atoms, which allows us to then build information about the way those atoms are connected together and ultimately form the structure of that compound. This is the same technology that is used in magnetic resonance imaging, uh, but the application is very different. NMR spectroscopy is useful for determining or for, for determining information about the way atoms are connected to make a structure. Magnetic resonance imaging uses information about chemical environment of the hydrogen atoms, particularly in the water molecules in your body, to determine whether or not there are you know, abnormal things going on in the tissues where those water molecules are present. So how does it work? We're going to start with the simplest of all nuclei, the hydrogen nuclei, which is a single proton. Each proton is a positive charged particle, and I'm representing it as a sphere with a plus sign in the middle of it. Uh, and, and in subsequent pictures, the plus sign is going to go away uh, for clarity. So each proton is a positive charged particle, and it spins, or it has some quantum mechanical property that behaves like spin. Uh, individual protons might not spin in a way that we can you know, recognize in our macroscopic world, but they have some property that behaves like spin, and I'm representing that spin with a, a continuous circular arrow that goes around the equator of the proton. You may have taken courses in, in physics or, or learned about electricity and magnetism, and you might know that spinning particles or even moving charged particles generate magnetic fields. But if you haven't heard that before, I'm going to say it again moving charged particles generate magnetic fields. Particles that are spin generate magnetic fields that produce a, a, a circular magnetic pattern, kind of like what I've illustrated here. The, the thin arrows that are going around in a circle, originating at the top of the proton and wrapping around either to the left or the right uh, and ending up back at the bottom of the proton, are representing the lines of the magnetic field and are generally indicating the direction of that magnetic field. At the proton itself, the overall direction of the magnetic field is upward, and that's what the large bold arrow is representing. And that bold arrow is labeled B, so that we can, you know, rec so that, and, and B is going to be our letter that we represent the magnetic field direction with. So. It's going to be important to us later what direction those magnetic fields are in. So to sum up this page, again, protons are spinning charged particles and they generate magnetic fields. And if you notice and you're interested in the physics, uh, you know, for us it's not a big deal, but that magnetic field that is being generated is being generated perpendicular to the spin in a way that's predictable. Uh, and as you study physics, then you spend a lot of time trying to predict the direction of these magnetic fields. For us at the moment, it's just useful to know that protons have magnetic fields. In a collection of random protons, these magnetic fields are all probably pointing in random directions. There's nothing that necessarily induces them to, to want to point in a specific direction or the other. Um, and, and if this were the case for all protons everywhere, we wouldn't be able to learn anything about the, these protons because their individual uh, magnetic fields would be um, all pointing in random directions and would average out to zero and we wouldn't learn anything about them. Yeah. However, if we apply a strong external magnetic field, in this case we're going to represent our external magnetic field again with the letter B, but we're going to use the word zero to, to represent that this magnetic field is outside the number zero, sorry, outside the proton. If we apply an external magnetic field, protons either line up their fields that are in aligned with the field or opposed to the field. And you might hear chemists talk about spin aligned or spin opposed. 
given the quantum mechanical nature of what's going on here, some folks don't distinguish between the proton spin and the magnetic field that it generates, um, but they're technically two different physical phenomena, but they're really intertwined with each other. Uh, so our individual protons will, will line up with a strong external magnetic field, either with their magnetic fields aligned or opposed to that external magnetic field. And those two states have different energies. The spin aligned state, sometimes called alpha, uh, is usually lower in energy than the spin opposed state, usually called beta, and there's a difference in energy uh, that can be measured. And usually that difference in energy is in the radio, or is, it corresponds to radio wave frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum. And so here comes our, our radio part. If we bombard those protons with radio waves of the appropriate frequency that matches that change in energy, we can cause a spin flip. The, the spin of the proton will flip so that the magnetic field is going from aligned to opposed or opposed to aligned and we can measure the absorbance of radio wave frequency. Technically we, are actu we actually measure the radio frequencies that are spit back out by protons as they go from their excited state back to their ground spin state but in practice we could measure either absorbance or emission of, of radio wave photons. Uh, the difference in energy between the two spin states uh, it depends on the, the strength of the external magnetic field. Protons sitting in a stronger magnetic field are going to have a larger energy difference between their two spin states. And this is going to be important in a minute. Uh, the behavior of protons can be generalized to any atomic nucleus that has an odd number of protons or or and or an odd number of neutrons. Common uh, nuclei in organic chemistry that are examined this way are, are the 1H or, or typical hydrogen nucleus, the 2H deuteriums, this is the heavier isotope of hydrogen, uh, carbon-13, so one of the isotopes of carbon, 19 fluorine, the, the major isotope of fluorine, and 31 phosphorus, the major isotope of phosphorus. But any isotope or any nucleus that has an odd number of protons and or neutrons uh, can be uh, a general or can be analyzed by nuclear mass nuclear magnetic spectroscopy. For the moment we're going to focus on 1H or proton NMR spectroscopy because it's the most common and it's the most useful for an organic chemist. We'll come back in a later video and talk about carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy because of course uh, carbon is a very important element in organic chemistry as well. It just turns out that carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy doesn't contain quite as much useful information uh, as hydrogen NMR spectroscopy and you'll see why. And it turns out fortunately for us, that in addition to, to being dependent upon the strength of the external magnetic field, the strength or the, the difference in energy between the two spin states is also dependent on the structures of the molecules that these nuclei are found in. If, if all protons behaved exactly the same way, regardless of the structure of molecules, we would have, have a very curious but not particularly useful technique. So it's very, very good for us that also the structure of the molecule matters. Uh, let's learn a little bit more about how that works. But first, let's learn a little bit about how we collect an NMR spectrum. Uh, most NMR spectra are collected in solution uh, and almost all uh, solvents that we might use for dissolving organic compounds contain hydrogen atoms. Uh, and that would be a big deal if we hadn't figured out a way around it. And imagine if you made a solution that was, you know, a thousand mo molecules of solvent for every one molecule of your sample and collected its NMR spectrum, you would see a lot of uh, signals that come from your solvent. Um, fortunately, we have learned how to systematically replace all of the hydrogen atoms in a molecule with the heavier isotope deuterium and we represent deuterium with the letter D uh, when it's incorporated in a chemical structure. And so some common deuterated solvents which contain no hydrogen atoms in their structure 
or chloroform D dichloromethane D2. So you see that the, the, the suffix or the end of this of the name describes how many deuterium atoms are in the structure. Deuterium oxide, the, the deuterated version of water, methanol, acetonitrile, acetone, dimethyl sulfoxide, benzene, etc. And there are many, many other deuterated solvents available for specialty purposes um, for, for NMR spectroscopy. So we use deuterated solvents so that we don't see signals from, from the solvent, which is good. This is an NMR example of an NMR spectrum, and this is the NMR spectrum of ethanol. Uh, the structure of ethanol is shown with all of its hydrogen atoms uh, explicitly shown. Uh, while we are getting used to looking at organic molecules with their hydrogens hidden, uh, for the sake of looking at hydrogen NMR spectra, it's probably going to be helpful for us to see some of these hydrogen atoms. Uh, Across the bottom of the spectrum is our horizontal scale, and it's in parts per million. That's what PPM stands for. The horizontal scale is called the chemical shift scale, and it's the chemical shift that is describing the difference in energy between the spin states of those hydrogen atoms and, and the molecule of ethanol. And, and the values of that scale are determined based on the relative difference in energy for an internal standard. And as I mentioned earlier, the internal standard is tetramethylsilane. You can see a number of signals in the peak, uh, or in the, in the spectrum. Each of these signals is called a peak, uh, so using terminology from other types of spectroscopy. And these peaks can be integrated to represent the number of hydrogen atoms that each peak represents. And so the big numbers that are underneath each of the peak on the spectrum shown are the integration numbers. So the peak on the far right represents three hydrogen atoms. The one in the middle represents one hydrogen atom. And the one on the left represents two hydrogen atoms. And then those peaks are not necessarily single things, but they are split into like sub peaks. And we'll talk about what creates that splitting in a, in a little bit. If you notice, uh, the chemical shift scale in parts per million starts with a zero on the right and goes to 11 or sometimes 12 on the left. We're usually used to reading graphs with the low number on the left and the high number on the right. Uh, the reason for zero being at the far right is that zero actually represents the highest absolute chemical shift. Zero or the, the chemical shift, uh, zero is the defined chemical shift for tetramethylsilane and it's assigned to the highest radio wave frequency that is used to s flip the spins of protons. Most organic molecules have protons that require less radio wave energy than tetramethylsilane. And so the, the parts per million then is a difference from tetramethylsilane. And that peak that looks like it is sitting at 1.3 parts per million has a chemical shift that is 1.3 parts per million less than that of uh, tetramethylsilane. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Or apparently in another video. Up next is a video on interpreting NMR spectroscopy. And we're going to talk more about the chemical shift scale, how we integrate the peaks what kind of information we can learn from those peaks and where that splitting pattern comes from. Thank you for watching.